or anyone were or will be punished per se. But they say that suicide is a lot like dropping out of school. If at some point you decide to return, you have to pick up where you left off and um, sometimes have to kind of back up a little bit in order to, you know, continue on. And so it really just does you a disservice in terms of your um, eternal consciousness. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Dr. Gannon, this thing about where does this reside? Or, I mean, where the, is it in the heart? Or is it in the soul? Or is it in the conscience? If, if you guys still blame for that? Or is anybody ever come beyond the argument of, of, of yeah um, the question uh, is um, you know what it does where does this experience reside or what is involved here is it our heart or our consciousness or our soul um, it, these words are kind of hard to deal with because um, it, the word soul conjures up religious associations and so um, near-death researchers have tried to study the experience um, with awareness of religion and its um, possible role but not um, not using religious terms so in the near-death literature there's most often reference to consciousness that and just to talk about my consciousness was out of my body functioning with unusual clarity you know and able to remember and think and feel and all the things that we're able to do in the body but um, in a much more expanded and enhanced kind of way so um, it's you know and heart usually refers to um, emotions like with empathy and caring and those kinds of things and certainly that is a big part of near-death experiences but um, that's the best I can say is that researchers tend to just use the word consciousness. One of the things you pointed out was that experience with some other gatherers. Now these big yeah. people that would not have experienced our religious and psycho battle stuff in our world. Right. How did their experiences differ from the rest of the population. Yeah, so has anybody really got in there? Yeah, well there there are a few accounts from hunter gatherer cultures and the question is how do their accounts of their NDEs compare to ours? And there is unquestionably an influence of culture on the contents of near death experiences, partly because it, the person comes back to their body and their culture and their language and and that's all they have to explain what they've experienced but um, so people might see um, uh, spiritual entities related to their religious system uh, or they might see entities that they don't hang a label on um, and so the thing that uh, that Alan Kelleher, who d has done this, um, most looked most closely at this, has found is that um, there will be uh, transmaterial environments and entities, deceased loved ones, spiritual entities, in all near-death experiences worldwide throughout history. But the exact nature of the environment and the entities will differ related fairly strongly to the person's culture. Yes. Uh, has there ever been a case where there's more than one person involved? Like two people get in a car accident and they're both in it together? Yes, the question is uh, have there been cases where uh, and a near-death experience is corroborated um, between two people like they're in a car accident together and they have a similar experience and the answer is yes in fact Raymond Moody's most recent book is on shared death experiences so these are NDEs that were shared and he has you know many many cases of this and of course those contribute as like veridical perception to the um, um, the um, idea that the experiences are what they seem to be, not hallucinations and so forth. Mm -hmm. Yes? Uh, yes, it, it sounds like what they're all describing uh, is what uh, some of us who have been investigators in the field uh, is what we're finding in the uh, paranormal investigation in the spirit world. 
Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. I, uh, I've witnessed it several times, and uh, I, I mean, it sounds just just like it. Yeah. Here's this the spirit that is floating along. Mm -hmm. It's here. Mm -hmm. And yeah. We and I figured out exactly why they're still they're mm -hmm. here. They mm -hmm. they may not. Uh, one did not. Uh, didn't want to go to the light. Mm -hmm. She mm -hmm. was happy where she was, mm -hmm. doing what she wanted to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's it's kind of mm -hmm. she died a violent uh, death. death. Mm -hmm. and this was sort of Mike McCaskill. Mm -hmm. He talked to her mm -hmm. uh, while we were on another investigation. Yeah. And, uh, so that how, how similar they are. Yes. Yeah, so the, the comment is that um, in paranormal investigations of like deceased um, entities, that that what is found there seems to fit very well with what NDEs say. And I would say yes. And um, there's been investigation into after death communication where um, this is where an individual um, has communication with a deceased loved one that they knew. Um, there's convergence of evidence there and um, deathbed visions. People have visions um, a lot of times when they're in the process of dying like from cancer and they see deceased entities that are coming seemingly to um, help them over through the transition and so all of this seems to converge um, you know quite well and the the leaning in the professional literature now is to look at the question of the survival of consciousness after death not through just the lens of one of these kinds of experiences but to bring all of the convergence of evidence from these various kinds of experiences mm -hmm. some people have I know. We really want to know. Why, don't, why does, uh, do some people not, ha or most people not remember the experience? I, I, want to say, I do want to say one thing that um, we don't know that, that the people who don't report an NDE didn't actually have it. We only know that they don't remember it, or maybe they even remember it and aren't reporting it. But um, it does seem that a lot of people truly don't remember um, an experience. And we do have some cases of people who did remember the experience years later, that something triggered the memory of it. Um, so there's a possibility that at least some of the people um, who don't report it right away really did have one. Um, but. Um, we just really don't know. Uh, there's a little bit higher incidence among near-death experiencers and UFOers, by the way, of um, abuse in childhood, but it by no means is that a requirement. You know, uh, most, most NDEers had perfectly happy childhoods, you know, no more usual trauma than, you know, most other people. So, um, and there's also a little bit higher incidence of NDEers reporting that they had psychic experiences before the NDE. But once again, it's just a little bit higher. It's not in any way a requirement. So, um, we, we just really don't know. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If I could take all these people, all the people you've seen, all the others that have been through this, and let's whip an MMPI on them. Mm -hmm. I would, in my mind, that got to be something that makes them Sorry. different from others. But tell me not. Yeah, no. no. Um, the, the question is, you know, what if you whip an MMPI on them? Well, MMPI is to assess uh, psychopathology. And um, the Andy ears represent the full range of mental health. Um, most of them are mentally healthy, and if you have... Psych no, more now, after the NDE, there's, again, a little... In, um, higher level of um, a characteristic called psychological absorption and that's the ability to pay attention to something and not be distracted and end of ears score a little bit higher on that but just you know a, a higher but not you know they're not like um, off the charts or anything and we don't know whether maybe it was because of the NDE that they somehow have better focusing ability so, you know, hard to know. Yes? With well, some of these cases where uh, some of the people have had an experience of 
seeing a person they knew in life who had died, such as maybe a parent who was very old and very sick, do they see that person in this experience in a healthier way yeah. or as they were when they died? Yeah. Um, the question is when, uh, when a near-death experiencer sees a deceased person who was like you know, wasted away in cancer or something when they died, and now the NDE sees them, um, how does the person appear? And the answer is, they are healthy and whole, and usually appear to be kind of at the peak of their lives. And this also is true with after-death communication. In the experiences that I've had, um, I've had two or three, and the person always looked um, healthy and whole, or like in the case of my father, he died, he had it was in advanced Alzheimer's to the point that he didn't recognize me or my brother or sister, and he couldn't even feed himself. And in the after-death communication I had with him, I saw him um, uh, kind of like where, about the distance that you are and sitting kind of like where you are, but there were a table and a plate of food, and he was lifting a fork of food to his mouth, like very, you know, a, like he'd had this terrible Parkinsonian thing. So here he is lifting, and he stopped halfway, and he looked at me, and we just had that moment of, recognition and an absolute love exchange you know like nothing nothing else mattered but we just we love each other and that was and that was it and so he was um, he looked a little bit younger than he did when he died but it was kind of like he was on a healing trajectory you know he could like get nourishment and he was um, it was like he was moving backwards toward when he was you know really completely functional. So that's typical. Uh, hang on a minute, the lady in black. Uh, during a near-death experience, is the person experiencing uh, being able to mentally understand what they're doing, reasoning? Or is the reasoning coming after when they come back to the body? Some of it happens in, in the NDE and some of it happens afterwards. For example, um, I have an online continuing education program on near-death experiences with a lot of interview excerpts from NDEers, and um, one of them is, oh, and I meant to bring, well, I'll give it to Ken to um, give to you later a, a resource page um, about um, NDEs. But anyway, um, I have a, a one gal who had a rather extended out-of-body experience and while she she was a teenager, had been in a car accident and was unconscious and um, had this out-of-body experience and while this was happening she um, it, she became fascinated like she knew that she was dead and that was her body down there but you know, whatever. She said they could have cut the head off. She really didn't you know, it was okay, because um, she wasn't connected to it anymore. But she became fascinated with, wow, this is really amazing. So at one point she thought, I wonder if I can touch the wall over there. And she said the minute she thought it, this like, sort of like a cartoon hand took sh form and kind of went like this over to the wall and touched it and then went Droop! and disappeared. So um, uh, it's like, then she knew she could she could contact anything she wanted to. She could assume any, any perspective that she wanted to. And just by thinking, you know, I wonder what that looks like, boom, she'd be down there. And so, so there's some capacity to reason in the experience and, and some afterwards. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and yes. Is there any, of course, since all these people died, and I, I recall the uh, World Trade Center and the people making a conscious decision to get away from the flames and fall a hundred something stories and then uh, I knew a fellow that just last month fell from his airplane and they don't know how, what happened seven or eight thousand feet. It, you mentioned about people sometimes pop out of their body. Is there, I don't know how we'd know that unless you've had some after death communications from some of your well, some of the earliest reports in the professional literature of near-death experiences were by this guy named Heim, who was an Alps climber. 
and he had collected stories of people who had uh, fallen in um, climbing accidents and of course survived and to talk about it and what they said was that they were out of their body and watched the body fall so um, I tend to suspect that like in the World Trade Center that when those people were jumping off the building you know bless their souls um, that they probably were already disconnected well, that one that woman she's given her soul to Jesus yeah you know, she's just yeah you know, she's turned upside down mm -hmm. and, uh, I just it's, that's I think it can be comforting okay. to to know that um, when people have um, are in horrible critical situations like that that there may be some merciful disconnection from the suffering yeah yeah. Dr. Holden, you, you've made uh, the facts of death in many ways more appealing than a lot of the facts of life. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah. Um, so I want to remind you that we're all here for a purpose. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you mentioned making contact with your father. Are there things that we can do to do that on purpose with someone we love who's passed away? Yes. Um, so. Uh, in the, the book, uh, Chicken Soup for the Soul, Messages from Heaven, that's coming out um, actually in a few days, but I have advanced copies, because I have a story in there about an experience that I had while I was practicing a technique called induced after-death communication. And um, I, I'm not in private practice anymore since I've become a department chair. I, I just don't have time for it. But if any of you are interested in um, pursuing induced after death communication, I can refer you to one of my students that trained with me in it a few years ago. And does it, uh, one gal is in Dal uh, North Dallas and the other's in Denton. We just have time for a couple more questions. Okay, and anybody else? Wants to ask you one yes, one. okay. This is uh, similar to what you just said and Essentially, it would be, do you find the number of accounts of those who have had an ED, uh, NDE are able to return to that state of transmissible consciousness through methods similar to astral projection or any substance that alters states of consciousness? Yeah, well? that's a great question. Are NDEers afterwards able to return to that state of consciousness? Well, Pardon me? We couldn't hear you. Yeah, the question, the question is, um, are near-death experiencers afterwards able to return to that st same state of consciousness that they experienced during their NDE? And the answer, by and large, is no. And in fact, that's a source of tremendous um, regret for NDEers. I mean, they would love to go back there, but they can't, they can't recreate it. Now, um, they, uh, one of the after effects is that sometimes NDEers do have um, a propensity for out-of-body experiences and that sort of thing. But these experiences, by and large, are, are spontaneous and not anything that the person can cause to happen. They can try to create the circumstances to facilitate it, but they can't actually like make it happen. And certainly the experience of connectedness, I mean, I, I, <laughs> I need all my hands and feet and multiple times over to count the ND, number of NDEers who express profound longing to return to what they experienced. And also, con concurrently, a commitment to stay in life as long as they're you know, meant to be here. Yes, Pat. <clears throat> Everything we're talking about here right now seems to uh, contradict or defy a lot of the stuff we learn in schools. Uh, science, biology classes, physiology, all of these things, how the brain works. I'm wondering if you can make comments or just hear your thoughts about how this all fits in with our current, different scientific way, our cultural looks at the world and uh, mm -hmm. uh, medical and scientific communities, how they accept your research. Yeah. Well, the, the prevailing view in medical science right now is materialism. And that's the idea that um, everything can be reduced to physical processes. So in, according to that view, the brain produces consciousness. No one has been able to explain exactly how. How do neurochemical things in there create this rich subjective experience you know, that we all have? Um, 
but um, near-death experiences just challenge that paradigm. There is another philosophical position, which is non-materialism, and from that position, the brain functions like a, um, like a cell phone. It receives and transmits um, you know, sound and waves and that sort of thing, but it is not the, um, the creator of those. You know, it would not make sense for your phone to ring and somebody, a voice on there, and you think that the phone is producing the voice. And in the same way, the brain, uh, from this philosophical perspective, is like a cell phone. And so, um, of course, if you break the phone, the, the, um, you know, it's not going to function like it did. And if you mess with the circuits, they're not going to function like they did. But it's, uh, from the perspective of near-death experiences, it's a, a logical fallacy to assume that that means that the brain co um, was the creator of the thing that is now lost. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah, yes. Yes. This is my last one, I promise. <laughs> If your if your research seems to support or prove that consciousness can exist outside the body, does this open the door to all these other things that uh, you find in the paranormal section of the bookstore, uh, mm -hmm. clairvoyance and uh, precognition? Well, yes. Um, the question is whether NDEs seem to open the door to other paranormal or <laughs> transpersonal phenomena. And actually, if you think about it, a lot of those things actually occur in near-death experiences. People have after-death communication. They see the future. They, um, and even after they return from their NDEs, they become sort of clairvoyant or telepathic anyway, and also develop clairvoyant abilities. So, um, so the, all of these, almost all these things are related to NDEs themselves. So it all kind of ties together. Mm -hmm. And there was one or two other questions. Do we have time for one more? Yes, uh, one more. One more, last question. Uh, my wife passed away last year, and you know, she was flat on the bed, and just finished, and all of a sudden, she sat up straight and looked ahead of her, and I was wondering if maybe she was seeing her parents. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yeah. It's very, it's a very um, do well documented phenomenon. Uh, deathbed visions, or it's sometimes called nearing death awareness, and it even happens with people who have been comatose or people who have been um, have had like a debilitating disease like Alzheimer's. That shortly before death, they develop mental clarity and often um, do report seeing and and just have conversations with. Um, uh, with deceased loved ones typically, or it might be spiritual entity. And so, um, and that, that phenomenon of sitting up and looking at something um, is just very, um, and sometimes the person will then s will say the name of a deceased loved one and then you know what they're experiencing. But likely that is, at least it fits with all the, with other reports that that likely is what she was perceiving. Well, thank you very much. You're welcome. And yeah. thank you, Jen. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the fact is, she has so much more material to present, and it's all fascinating, that we've invited Dr. Holman to be our guest speaker on our radio program tomorrow night, and Pat Oscar will be the host. So at 8 p.m. on InceptionRadioNetwork.com, just put that in. It's an internet radio program. InceptionRadioNetwork.com. Epic Voyages will be on Pat Husker and Dr. Holden, and I guarantee you there's a lot more that she can cover. So uh, thank you very much You're for welcome. a wonderful presentation. I recommend both the books that she's uh, uh, co-authored uh, and important contributions to. We have them at the back, and she'll be here to sign books for a little while. We're going to meet <clears throat> after this, for those of you who are be joining us at the Big Fish Restaurant. Go back out on Main Street, turn right. You go about three blocks, four blocks. We'll be on your left side. It's a two-story building. Uh, the window in front says Big Fish, but there's plenty of parking in the back if there's none in the front.
and you'll be able to uh, continue the discussion there at, at dinner. So I uh, hope that uh, most of you can join us, and uh, I know some of you have plans. Uh, and uh, uh, we just uh, received our new shipment of yeah. hats, and uh, if you'd like to purchase one to help support our group, then I uh, appreciate their 10 bucks. And uh, so thank you very much for coming today. Remember, there's more to the great mysteries than you have. <coughs> So, next time we have this type of meeting, uh, please tell your friends and uh, bring them along. I think you'll find you'll enjoy it. So, thanks for coming. You know that um, one researcher actually did a comparison of UFOs and NDEers. Yeah, and it's in a book called The Omega Project. Kenneth Ring, yeah, uh huh, you know about that. Yeah, I know. I've read it. I don't care. I've got it somewhere. I didn't get through it. Yeah, yeah. Essentially, he found a lot of similarities. Yeah. Exactly. Or we're just not able to see them. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It does. Yeah. I want to say thank you.